When you think of Great Britain, what comes to mind? It might be green fields, country pubs, and well-mannered people queuing for red London buses. If you hear people talking like I do, you are right. That is what Britain is to me. But outside London in deprived areas, things can get pretty bleak. This is the country where the Brexit referendum vote tipped the scale towards leaving the EU. Working class country. One wonders what it is they think they've gained by Brexit. And an even bigger question is what they've genuinely gained. Let's start by showing what they were guaranteed in the first place. The biggest promise of all was presented to them on May the 11th, 2016. On May the 11th, 2016, Boris Johnson presented a red London bus with an enticing slogan written on the side. And if we vote leave on June the 23rd, we can take back control of £350 million pounds a week yeah, and spend on our priorities here yeah, in this country, yeah, exactly. including on the National Health Service. We can take back control of our immigration system. One could almost forget, but the British people never asked for a referendum. It was imposed on the public by politicians. Boris Johnson took the opportunity to profile himself and started throwing around false promises, like the £350 million a week. That would be the cost of European membership. Leaving the European Union would release this money to be spent on the National Health Service. Johnson wisely concealed the fact that the Brits also reaped countless benefits of membership in subsidies and trade. In any event, the bus had the desired effect. On June the 23rd, 2016, the British people voted for Brexit. Everyone knows who won, but not everyone knows how. When Britain woke up the day after the referendum, we Brits were indeed oblivious to the way the Leave campaign managed to win the vote. It took a feature film to change that. The image on the computer screen is the opening shot of the film Brexit, the Uncivil War. When it was broadcast, many a viewer couldn't believe that it was based on true events. Actor Benedict Cumberbatch interprets the main character, the leader of the Leave campaign, Dominic Cummings. In real life, Cummings has a bad reputation in the UK. A lot of people view him as a kind of evil political genius. Right up the alley of the actor. And this is James Graham, the film's scriptwriter. He remembers the day of the referendum vividly. He was in shock. Like so many of us, he never expected the Vote Leave campaign would actually win. What on earth happened? For the script, he started investigating the events leading up to the Brexit vote. It began to feel like a thriller. We only need for the front, like, three rolls. The film about the Vote Leave campaign was born. Wow. Hi, hi. It's the Cummings closet. Yeah, 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 yeah. <gasps> that looks incredible. <laughs> In a different branch of history, I was never here. Some of you voted differently, and this never happened. But I was, and it did. Everyone knows who won, but not everyone knows how. When Dominic Cummings was hired to run the Vote Leave campaign, he claimed a small room in the headquarters as his office space. It was in here that he plotted and schemed creating a master plan 
that had very little to do with the flaws of the European Union. Instead, he came up with a strategy that would exploit the feelings of British discontent. So before we get into the how of his strategy, we will focus on whom he targeted to get Britain out of the EU. That question, do you want to remain in the EU, do you want to leave the EU, because of the campaign that Cumming successfully ran, I don't think that's the question that people were answering. They were answering the question, are you happy with your life? Are you happy with the way things are going? And of course, a huge significant proportion of the country went, no, I'm absolutely unhappy. I'm unhappy and I'm angry. So of course they voted for change. Not rocket science, it's simple. There are three types of voter. Those certain to vote to exit, that's one third. Well, they're in the bag, so ignore them. Those certain to stay, it's another third, and we can't touch them, so fuck them. The last third, I would like to leave, but I'm worried about what the effect will be to jobs and living standards. These are the only people that we need to care about. Well, my name's Barry Anderson. I voted to leave. My name's Stephen Gascoigne. I'm 62, and I voted to leave. Voting-wise, Brexit, I didn't vote. I voted to leave. I voted leave in the referendum. It will appeal to their hearts, emotional resonance, their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations, their fears, their suspicions. Now, these persuadables, we need to learn about them, love them, and lure them to our side. There are more of them out there than we thought. So those three million persuadables, those three million people that Votely found off the grid who hadn't been targeted by political campaigners for a generation, they decided the referendum result. They have changed British history by their vote. These persuadables live in neglected areas like Sharbrook, a small town in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't exactly come across as a place that could change the course of British history, does it? It's one of those old mining towns where things changed beyond recognition after the pit closed. The arrival of a sportswear factory was hoped to be the cure for this. The Sharbrook community were pr promised jobs that never came to pass. When they opened the factory, I'll never forget, the owner, Mike Ashley, says, the locals will get jobs first. They actually recruited uh, Eastern Europeans to come into England, and he employs about 4,000, just over 4,000 people, and I should say 90% are foreign. They were speaking Polish or whatever language they were from, and it just put me again everything. We can tap into all these little wells of resentment, all these little pressures that have been building up, ignored over time. Since we've been in Europe, and we, it's free to go wherever you want. Everyone wants to come to England. I mean, we've got to take ownership back of the law, of our laws, and we've got to, we have got to have a say, a, a bigger say in what's happening in Britain. Because we're run by Brussels and we've got no say in anything. We can make this about something more than Europe. Europe just becomes a symbol, a cipher. Every, every bad thing that is happening has happened. Are they really interested in what happens to the public? Things have just got out of hand. We are proud people. Well, I want to talk. No, no, she's not bothered. Take something back means it was, is, rightfully yours, taken from you. I think that slogan, ultimately, take back control, was a small work of genius because it successfully created a coalition of the angry and the dispossessed and the disillusioned in this country and united them under, under one vague general mission. Uh, the, the cause of which wasn't clear and the solutions for which wasn't clear. But he, he, I, think that's, I think that slogan uh, was a key reason for why they won.
Let's take back control of this democracy, take back control of this country, show that we can stand on our own two feet again, because we can, can't we? Yes. For most people living in this part of Britain, that slogan, take back control, made perfect sense. But not to Guy Matthews. Guy is in as miserable a position as many around here, scraping to get by on meager wages, living in temporary accommodation, unable to find affordable living for himself and his pregnant girlfriend. Still, his own childhood laid the foundation for a different way of thinking. I think that Brexit is the story of class divide. We're about to hear a story that seems to come straight from a 19th century novel, but it took place only an odd 20 years ago. This is to record Guy's sixth birthday. He was six on November the 4th, 1993, wasn't it? For whoever thinks that Guy's story has nothing to do with Brexit, bear with this working class lad. Guy knows what he's talking about. I grew up on a country estate and it was a wonderful place to live. It was, it was quite an idyllic childhood. Oh, yeah. I know him. Hello there. He's a gardener. Uh, my dad was a gardener for a lord and lady. And mother was the housekeeper. Um, and I think that's where my class consciousness comes from, because that was very, very stark. Um, that wasn't a case of, of seeing things from the outside. That was a case of literally these people live in a manor because they were born to it because of who their parents were and hereditary privilege. Uh, whereas my mum and dad were working class gardener. Um, they weren't treated very well. <laughs> One of my earliest memories was in the manor. They had, um, they had a nursery. They had all sorts of books and toys and things in. And uh, my mum put me in there when I was about five or six, um, just while she cleaned the house. Oh, just playing there, that kind of thing. Um, and I remember reading, uh, I was reading uh, Baba, Baba the Elephant, and um, it was all in French. So obviously I'd come across it, I was like, what are all these words that I don't know? And I was trying to teach myself French, basically. Um, and the, the lady of the house, um, she came in and she, uh, she snatched the book off me. She says, what are you doing with that? That's not for the likes of you. And I, I remember thinking, you know, why? Why, why am I not allowed that book? Um, yeah, and basically it was because, you know, I'm, I'm the son of the help. What, what am I doing in the nursery with the nice things? Guy is in his 30s now, working as a chef on a zero-hours contract in a local pub. He loves his job, though it doesn't really pay the bills. He couldn't be further removed from the fairy tale environment he grew up in as a child. But the humiliation his family suffered there makes him wary of anyone from the upper class. For me, the working class is everyone. It's, it's me, British, white, you know, 30 years old. Um, it's also Magda, who's Polish. It's, um, say, um, Kamal, who's Indian, and we're all the working class, and yet, and yet we saw, some of us saw Brexit as a chance to get rid of that segment of the working class because they're coming over here and taking our jobs. Um, so I think, I think Brexit is a story of division, and I think those divisions were stoked to, to a great degree by the upper class. The manor is abandoned now. The lord and lady that used to live here still hold a position in the House of Lords, exerting political power based on birthright. Going back to the country estate, where Guy grew up engenders mixed feelings for both him and his father, John. It hurts John's professional pride, seeing the abandoned state of the garden. I want to put it all back again. Put it back to how it was. <laughs> and although they were happy as a family here, the visit also brings back some unpleasant memories. Guy's parents put up with bad treatment for years. One day, however, drunk, 
The lord of the house went too far, calling his gardener all sorts of names over a minor incident. John resigned. Sometimes you've just got to bite your lips and muddle through it the best you can. He couldn't endure the humiliation any longer. So the family left their comfortable cottage for an uncertain future filled with hardship and the collapse of the marriage. For Guy, it meant the end of a happy childhood. Yeah, teenage years were great fun. Mum and Dad uh, got divorced. Uh, yeah, I went off the rails. Um, um, drink, drugs, petty crime, usual, usual teenage off the rails kind of thing. There's there's a lot of poverty when I was a teenager. You know, I think I think one day I didn't have the bus fare to get into town, to to have dental treatment, and so yeah, so I lost a tooth because of that. That, that is an effect of poverty. It makes you feel worthless. Um, there's a big culture in Britain of if you're not, if you're not economically active, if you, you you're somehow a lesser member of society. Yeah, poverty's poverty's shit. <laughs> poverty's awful. It, it is. It becomes. It sort of takes over your whole existence. It becomes who you are, and it's very very difficult to get out of. Yeah, like I said, Mrs. has got, uh, got a baby on the way. I'm scared of failing as a dad. Yeah, I think that comes from... Yeah, I think that comes from poverty. Yeah. I don't want my kid to grow up in poverty. Never. I think in Britain there's a myth that the upper class doesn't have as much control as it used to because, you know, we don't... you don't see barons whipping their servants in the streets and stuff like that. Eton, the, the top bloody private school in the UK, which charges multiple, multiple thousands of pounds a term for their students to go there, and they've had 24 prime ministers. So we've had 24 prime ministers come for a school that is for rich people that is for members of the establishment, for the members of the elite. And it's just a, it's just a funneling thing to, to get the right people into the positions of power. Um, the Conservative cabinet, they're all millionaires. What does that tell you about British politics? It's an absolute disgrace. You know, what, what do they know of, of working class life? What do they know of, you know, the daily struggle? The, do, I, do I turn the heating on or do I buy some food for my children? You know, we've got people going to food banks, and how are millionaires and, and sirs and barons and lords and ladies supposed to understand that? You know, because they've never lived it. They have no idea. One would think that this young and successful playwright living the good life in London doesn't understand either. But James comes from the very same background as Guy does, another working-class lad. So how come he escaped? You know, people often use um, anomalies, don't they, to, to, to say, oh, it is possible. Social mobility is happening in England. Look at this playwright who grew up in a mining town. Therefore, we don't need to fix it, or we don't need a radical solution. Yeah, just and actually, have to work harder. Just have to work harder. So if this one guy can do it, why can't you do it? And you think, well, that's possible because I didn't fall into drugs when I was 17. That's possible because my parents had long-term employment. That's because I had somewhere warm to sleep. That's because I had a bedroom where I could do my homework. That's because I had a teacher who said it wasn't silly or unmasculine to do theatre instead of sports. It's just, you know, I, none of that is my responsibility. I'm just, I was just lucky. Dominic Cummings' campaign, designed to persuade Brits to vote for Brexit, bombarded them with the slogan, take back control, every day on radio and television. However, the most important propaganda weapon was invisible to political opponents as well as to journalists and Europhiles. None of them had a clue about the message the dissatisfied working class received all the while on their cell phones. Do you remember that bus? Oh my God, the bus. It's all people still talk about. 
with the false promise of millions of pounds extra for health care, if only we left the European Union, that bus turned out to be just the beginning. Wait, wait, that's the... Uh, you're, you're, you're using the NHS with the economy, with control. But, but, but the logo, that's, that's the actual NHS logo, I know. Are we, are we allowed to just imagine their faces? <laughs> Let's take back control! Let's take back control! <laughs> Terrific! Uh, absolutely. Can you open up? Marvellous. Um, yes. The three million persuadables that the Vote Leave campaign found live in places like this. <coughs> For years, politicians didn't really bother about them. <coughs> and let's face it, most of us didn't feel they were important. They were just there. I'm sorry, just, I'll, I'll just have a quiet cough and I'll be OK. <coughs> so all they needed was someone like Dominic Cummings to give them a voice. You've got to give the man credit for that even if he did manipulate them. Well, I was very 50-50 anyway. As I say, it wasn't until I was in the booth really thinking, what do I do? And when you have on a great big red bus and you've got the now Prime Minister in front of it saying 350 million for the NHS, we're still going to have a great close relationship. Just think what that extra money can do. And for us, our local hospital, at that time they were thinking of closing the accident and emergency. And the closest one to us would be Basildon. Mm. So it's like this could actually mean that we can secure the hospital. It what it was a deciding factor for me. Emma Nucky and her parents are a typical working class family, struggling with quite a few health problems. Over the years, they've been very dependent upon the National Health Service. Their appreciation of the institution is unlimited. It doesn't matter where you're from. Mm. It doesn't matter how much money's in your pocket. It doesn't matter whether you're vis you know, whether you're visiting or whether you've lived there all your life. It should be if you are in need, you can get help. You do not have to worry. The important thing is your health, your life, and it's again showing that value for the person. They certainly saved my life earlier this year. That they were fantastic, yeah. even if the doctor said he might not be able to resuscitate. Yeah. Because of my age and because I'm diabetic. And uh, I've got my pacemaker and I can breathe again, so I'm, I'm, I am very grateful. <coughs> the £350 million pounds a week we send to the EU, which we will no longer send to the EU, can you guarantee that's going to go to the NHS? No, I can't. 17 million people have voted for leave. Yep. Based, I don't know how many people voted on the basis of that advert, but that was a huge part of the propaganda. You're now saying that's a mistake? We have a £10 billion a year. And then obviously the morning after the referendum on Good Morning Britain, you had Mr Farage say, oh, that pledge, that promise done by vote leave, that was, that was a mistake. You um, said that? Yeah literally the morning after, and I was like, you said, how can you do that? Because <laughs> if you're saying that, that that's a mistake, that is something that, for me, was the swaying factor. That, re that really hurt. Yeah. That really scared me as well, because then I'm thinking, hang on, if you're lying like that and this is just one day, what else is going to happen? People like Emma and her parents have been a blind spot for politicians for such a long time, they could never have imagined being the target of any campaign, let alone a very sophisticated digital one. Most people don't really know how campaigns work. Most people don't understand how a policy um, gets filtered through a message and then that is communicated to us. I, I don't really understand that. So when I started writing it, I just realised my country has changed because of this referendum, but I don't know how you run a referendum in a modern society. 
And obviously one of the, the biggest elements of that, I think, that is how much technology is changing the way that we receive information and how it's affecting our behavior. It was surprisingly hard to find online for an online analytics company. Not really in the business of advertising what we do. Which is what? Just so that I'm absolutely sure it's what I need. Technically, we use sophisticated algorithms to micro-target populations in political campaigns. These social media platforms know what questions we're asking, what keeps us awake at night, when we sleep, where we go, who we go there with. And therefore, the system can make predictions. It does. And I think we all know basic things. I know that if I look up a... If I consider buying a sofa from a shop, that an advert will follow me around the internet. I, most people know roughly how um, how cookies and information trails work. What I didn't, what I don't think people understood, was how my referendum was going to be different to your referendum. So your timeline was slightly different to your friends, your moms, and so on. And our software can test how effective certain ads are on certain people in terms of liking, clicking, sharing, and then learn how to adapt them to improve them in real time. In real time? Mm hmm Social media platforms are designed to find like-minded people better than people can. Our system will locate and target people that no campaign has ever targeted before. People who don't and have never voted anti-establishment, angry, your people. Dominic, we have already started to find them. Three million extra votes. Fuck off. All of them yours that the other side have no idea exist. And what actually Vote Leave were very good at were digital advertisements coming direct to your phone or your Facebook page which were very emotional, very emotive, sometimes even only sort of tenuously linked to the European question. They would send an advert with a cute little polar bear on it going, do you like polar bears? And people do like polar bears. So they clicked on it saying, yes, I like polar bears. And then that would take you through to the Vote Leave website where they would discuss why being in the European Union was bad for polar bears. Here are some of the ads we've been developing that are ready to test. Look at this one for the Euro Championships. Football, no politics, football. Brilliant. A chance to win 50 million quid if you guess the results at every single game. The point is that we can collect hundreds of thousands of contact details to get people out to vote. It's like 20 questions. With every click, we know you better, so our ads can target you better. And that just meant that Vote Leave had a data set for a huge chunk of the electorate that they could try and activate. So on the morning of the election, of the referendum, they would send out text messages based on the phone numbers they got from something completely irrelevant, a competition. I didn't see it. I didn't see these adverts because my behavior online suggests I was gonna vote Remain. So I just didn't see them. So I didn't, I didn't get angry about the polar bear advert or the football advert as being nothing to do with the debate at heart, because I just didn't see it. Nor did the journalists, nor did the politicians, because they're not part of that group. So as a campaign, you can operate with complete impunity, targeting people in that group, because the other group isn't going to see it. Most Brexit voters are still convinced to this very day that Britain is taking back control. But journalists have woken up to the fact that this conviction is often based on disinformation spread by the Vote Leave campaign on social media. Radio journalist James O'Brien tenaciously spends show after show challenging his callers on their unsubstantiated views. In terms of, in terms of measurable, tangible benefits, what did you win? Uh, well, for me, one of the ones is um, the plug system. Pardon? Um, I know it's not very... Uh, Hugely, but we obviously use free pin plugs in this country. Yes. The EU don't. And uh, so basically, it means that our safety aspects are a lot stronger than. Mate, just pa no, pause for a minute and yeah. think about what you've just done. You've come live on national radio. Yeah. You've described yourself as a Brexiteer. And when I've <laughs> asked you what you think you've won, you've said the right to have three pin plugs that we already have. It's just about the fact that the country has lost its identity. What does that mean? And that, 
what I've just said. That you don't, you've just said that you don't like seeing brown faces at the hospital. Okay, if you went down to my local and one of my sons tried to get a job down, or two of my sons tried to get a job down there, and at one point, James, there was 23 tills open and 22 of them, okay, yes, mate. had uh, Indians or Pakistani people. But we're talking now, about the European uh, Union, Steve. Yeah. The radio host challenges opinions that sound like echoes of the adverts pushed by the Vote Leave campaign. Because these adverts were tailored to very personal fears and wishes, Brexiteers voted the way they did for a large variety of reasons. This is exactly what makes Emma feel so uneasy about her vote, with hindsight. There are a lot of people who've got so many different reasons for having voted the same way I did. And that was the sneaky thing I feel about Vote Leave. They said so many different things to everybody, because when you ask someone, you tend to come out with lots of different things that were made to them. I have been lied to chronically. That's a fact. Do I feel I should have still voted the way I did? Hell no. I want my vote back if I could, but that's never going to happen. I made a bad decision. Sadly, based on a lot of lies told by some very clever people. No means were shunned to pull the Brits out of Europe. And although there may very well be good arguments to leave the European Union, the problem is that those arguments were hardly ever made during the campaign. Moreover, most economists believe that Brexit will have a devastating effect on British society. Only a small elite will predictably profit economically as well as politically. So, four years after the referendum, many people have come to the painful realisation that they voted against their own interests. I was wrong. I am so sorry. Oh, Bill, mate, come on. <laughs> what have I done to my country? So Bill, 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 yeah. there's 17.4 million people. You can't take all the blame on your own shoulders, my friend. Come on, and look at the effort. These people are billionaires. They own the Ritz, Bill. They own the Daily Telegraph. They wouldn't have spent all that money and put all that effort into trying to persuade you to act against your own interests if they didn't think it was plausible. I'm not going to let you blame yourself, Bill. All right? Well, well, no. Well, blame yeah, them, Bill. Blame them, Bill. Do not blame yourself. The total number of votes cast in favour of leave was 17 million. Even for Brexiteers, the election results came as a bit of a shock. Winning the referendum was one thing, but what would be the aftermath for British society? Dad. Hello. Hello. Are you looking forward to January? Not really, it's going to be cold and wet. It will be cold and wet, yeah. You get what you want, though. You get your, uh, get your country back. No, we won't. No, we won't. You can't. They'll stitch us up. Yeah. What do you reckon it'll be like, though, if we come out? We could be struggling. Yeah. But it's a two-way thing. Mm -hmm. They need us as much as we need them. Which doesn't actually help anyone, does it? No. Shit. I mean, at the end of the day, if the politicians stopped being little schoolboys in the playground and they sat down and talked about it properly. Oh, God, I'm knackered. It's been a long day today. Guy's father voted out believing, as so many others did, that it meant the Brits would have their country back. One wonders, though, what it was that people were longing for. And why did they believe that leaving the European Union would restore this ideal past? 
I don't want to go as far as saying uh, because the English are credulous fools. <laughs> um, but I think I think that it, the politicians and the people driving it told them told them what they wanted to hear. They wanted to say, you know, Britain can be great, but it's the EU holding us back, and that made sense to people. They take our fish, they take all our waters, and they do what they want. They're not bothered about the UK. That's my opinion. That's why I voted out, because we'll be a stronger country on its own. Um, it certainly comes from our imperial history. You know, we ruled what, almost half the world at one point, and you know, we were raised on stories of that. You know, Britain ruled the world. Um, what's one of our most famous songs? Britannia ruled the waves. Um, yeah, so I think there's, a, there's such a thing as British exceptionalism, similar to US exceptionalism. Um, we tend to think that we're better than our continental cousins or that we don't need them. Uh, my mum and dad have always said that it'd be best to leave because uh, they've got that whole make Britain great again thing going on, you know, uh, make Britain independent, you know, like it used to be. It would be lovely. I think in an ideal world that would be what I would want, but I, I don't necessarily think that's possible anymore. I was, um, I was saying to someone the other day, you can sum it up. Um, two world wars and one World Cup. And that's what we won. And that is the mindset of a lot of British people. Sometimes it's said tongue in cheek, but some people fervently believe in that. You know, they think, you know, we're the best. It feels good, doesn't it? To think of this glorious, independent Britain. But the fact of the matter is, since we left the European Union, we are on our own. It's like throwing a party that descends into carnage and being left to clean up the mess alone the morning after. It makes you wonder how we Brits can move forward from here. I think we can all agree that the damage that happened to our politics and to our social fabric was, un was sort of unforgivable. Uh, no matter whether we should or should not be in the European Union, that campaign has had lasting damage on, on the, the way in which we speak to each other as a society, the, the way it divided us into these camps, the way it changed the culture of, of politics. They're going to create an us and them situation. Seeing the increase of xenophobia was scary as anything. That was really horrific. It's like you, there was, you, people were posting pictures they'd seen outside of um, tube stations in London, like Polish rats go home. Then you see in the Sun newspaper headlines like EU rats. It's disgusting, there is no excuse. Now for me, I think a lot of people, when they voted leave, they felt this is nothing personal to anybody. Mm. This is not a personal attack. This is just how we personally feel. Let's make the best of it, have a good relationship together and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that I felt that is disgusting, but that does not represent what I feel. There was an understanding that we will leave it better than we found it. My children will have more opportunities and a better standard of living than I had. That is gone. And that this is the first time that's happened in 200 years. We, are, we'll be, we will be measurably worse off than the generation before us. Yeah, I'll, um... Yeah, the kid will be going to university. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, that kid's gonna move up in our dreadfully class-based society. Um, which, you know, the, the activist in me, the, the revolutionary in me, just tear it all down, you know, burn it all, destroy the Houses of Parliament, start again. But the dad in me is it's not going to happen. Play the bloody system, do what I didn't and, and, you know, move up there. Yeah, you'll never have to burn shoes to keep warm like I did. So it's almost, almost Dickensian, it's, yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully I will do things right and my kid will never, ever have to go through that. And neither will theirs. It is easy to be dismissive of the people that voted for this radical change 
in 2016. To condescendingly say that they must be idiots, racists, driven by nostalgia. It is easy, because people who speak like I do never encounter the problems they face every day. Still, it is hard to see now, just before our island is finally cut off from the mainland, if the change they voted for will bring them what they need. If it will bring us what we all need. Dominic Cummings has pushed the reset button to our system, but does anyone have a clue what's next? Uh, anyone under the age of 21 probably looks at Britain and its systems and wants to burn it all down, not in a dissimilar way to Dominic Cummings. Their motivations may be different. They may want a progressive, tolerant, liberal society that is, uh, that is the antithesis to what the ultra-right conservatives want, but everybody wants change. Nobody thinks this is good. No one thinks Britain is working. Um, I'm yet to find any inspiring leader on the left or right that has a positive vision for what it might be.